Welcome to the Acton Institute Events Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. In this episode, we bring you an Acton lecture featuring Dr. Patrick Gary as he addresses the false promise of big government. Gary is a law professor with a PhD in constitutional history. He has testified before Congress on constitutional issues and is a contributor to the Oxford Companion to the United States Supreme Court. He is the author of numerous constitutional law books, including Wrestling with God, The Court's Torturous Treatment of Religion, and An Entrenched Legacy, How the New Deal Constitutional Revolution Continues to Shape the Role of the Supreme Court. To learn more about upcoming and previous Acton Institute events, please visit our website at acton.org events. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Institute Events is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Great to be here, and uh, great to have uh, the students here. You know, in, in my classrooms, the students never sit in the first two rows. Uh, they start with the back and, and fill up, although um, I think some of them have begun to realize that if they sit in the front rows, they don't get called on as much. So keep that in mind uh, uh, when you pick your seating arrangements there later in. in uh, you sometimes get professors who feel compelled to call on their students. So thanks for uh, making me feel at home. You know, Charles Dickens came up with some great character names. David Copperfield. I think of David Copperfield. Very majestic, very heroic. You know you like the, 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 the boy even before you begin reading him. And then, of course, Uriah Heep. You just kind of want to shiver off that name. And then, of course, the most famous name maybe is Scrooge. It's so important that it's, it's gone from a, a um, proper name to a general purpose noun. So I think about why I think about Scrooge now, of course, we're entering the era of Christmas and, and, and Christmas parties and going to Christmas parties. Um, it's hard, not to, it's hard to avoid the talk of politics at Christmas parties, and, and I always have thought that there's really two groups of, of people at, at, at Christmas parties. Uh, uh, we're talking about politics and social problems. There's the first group, of course, um, <clears throat> that immediately begin their dialogue with, you know, there ought to be a federal government, dot, 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 or, you know, the government ought to, and then on and on. Now, this group, I've found, is the fun group. Um, the, the group that everybody loves, the generous group. They're the popular group uh, at the party. I call them kind of the holiday party Santa Clauses. Then there's the other group, of course, that in response to the federal government ought to, the group that says, well, maybe we ought to think about that, or on second thought. And then they go on uh, with their explanation. These are not the fun group, the group that anyone wants to be around. This is not the loving and generous group. Um, this is the miserly group, and of course, these are the Scrooges. And I found that, um, uh, that, that over time, what Scrooges eventually do after being berated for so long, they eventually just quit talking and end up at the food table. And you know, I think that Scrooges gain a lot of weight during the holiday season. Um, uh, and uh, that, what, what I want to suggest today, in effect, is, is perhaps is that maybe our labels of Scrooge and Santa Claus are misplaced, um, and uh, uh, that we ought to rethink, really, who is the Scrooge and who is the Santa Claus. So the narrative, I think, at the holiday parties, then, is one of this. The, the proponents of a continually growing or expanding government uh, hate social justice and Poverty, the first thing. Um, these, of course, social injustice and poverty are caused by the private economy and private society. And then the government is the only means to cure these ills. Kind of the three components, I think, of that narrative. And contained within the narrative, then, is what I call the myth and the slander. So the myth says that big government, then, becomes necessary to aid the average person. Big government is like a vital antidote to the injustices of the private sector. And then the corresponding slander, of course, then is that opponents of big government then are, are selfish, mean-spirited defenders of the rich and powerful. 
And this slander has really been applied against you know, the two traditional arguments against big government. Those arguments have been, first, cost. You, you oftentimes hear that, is that we can't afford this size of a government. Well, to that, the defenders of big government claim that, that those people are just simply trying to defend the rich and powerful, not wanting to increase the tax rates uh, on the rich, and that's the only reason that they don't want big government is because of the tax burden on the wealthy. The other primary argument used against big government is the constitutional argument. So we can't have this, this federal government that can do anything and anywhere and transcend all the traditional constitutional boundaries because it violates the Constitution. Well, once again, I think the response to this has been that, that, that um, the, the, the opponents of big government are just using that argument to try to keep government from helping the little guy, the average person, and that in fact they're favoring abstractions like constitutional provisions over real life and real people. So these arguments then, this cost and this constitutional argument, uh, haven't been able to sort of stem the tide of big government and I think have just simply fed into the myth then, this myth of big government. Neither one of them really takes on, takes head on, I think, the primary justification for big government. Neither one really takes on the myth, and that is whether that, that big government is a very necessary uh, aid to the average person. And that's the aim of my book. That's what I try to do uh, in my book, is to take on this myth in, in a very direct uh, manner. I don't mean to discount or downplay the cost or constitutional arguments. It said I just want to focus really on the heart of what I call um, this myth. And I think it's really the first step then in a meaningful debate on the scope and size and role of government in, in our society. So a lot of times um, people will ask the question, you know, look at our federal debt. Our federal debt now exceeds $20 trillion, a figure that I don't really even know how to comprehend in my own mind. Uh, the, the federal debt um, is now 77% uh, uh, of GDP. That's more than doubled in just 10 years. So it's astonishing. And people say, why can't, though, we ever do anything about that? There's lots of answers to it. There's lots of complex procedural answers. Why does, why politically can't we do it? I think there's a lot of institutional answers. But I think at the very core is, is addressing this, um, this myth and slander, as I say, is that we really can't get to the debate if we don't address the, the emotions and labels and images attached to it uh, and see that, in fact, that, that I think the slander, again, has silenced the debate on this particular issue. So is it insensitive to poor, working, and middle-class Americans um, uh, to oppose big government? I answer no, because big government in actuality is often not beneficial to the so-called little guy. In fact, it can oftentimes be harmful to the little guy. So if we really want to help the individual, maybe what we need to do is better focus and restrain government. Now, I want to clarify the terms a bit that I'm using. I, I use the term big government, so we oftentimes hear that. I use that term because it's a common term and we, we sort of have an immediate reaction to it. But it is not, um, it, it is not reflect an opposition to government per se. Oftentimes, I think we cast the argument that people either want lots of government or no government. That's not it at all. Remember, the constitutional framers very much wanted a strong central government. That's why they, they, um, they drafted and ratified the Constitution to replace the Articles of Confederation. They wanted a strong central government. And um, I'm in favor of a limited government, but I believe in a strong central government. So it's not the question of saying that government is bad or that saying that government shouldn't exist. Big government, in a way, in our society is a reality. And there's no desire to go back to 18th century and the kind of federal government we had uh, at that point. So the argument isn't against big government per se. The argument really is against the myth. It, it's against the automatic assumption 
that the federal government is the greatest force available for improving the welfare and condition of the average person and that it always acts uh, on behalf of the little guy. That's really where the, the issue is. Likewise, with limited government, I also think in the book, I use the term defined government or controlled government. I just think limited government now has, a, has attained such a like pejorative image in a way. We think of limited government as being people that want to um, get rid of government altogether. Again, that's not true, but it should be a defined. We, we define government to address certain problems in certain ways and it do, a government does not become something that indiscriminately expands over all areas of our society. So um, the way to uh, address the myth then is to, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, to, to first handle the, um, the history of the myth. And there I look back to the, the, the New Deal period uh, I think that's really the beginning of the myth, uh, the, a great expansion of the federal government during the New Deal period. Uh, and it was really the myth started off immediately. Why did it start immediately? Because the, the, the New Deal had no experience with big government. For 150 years, the United States government had operated on more or less a limited government model. And in the 1930s, that model suddenly and very abruptly changed. Now, you can understand it abruptly changed because the country faced its worst, worst economic uh, crisis in its history. And so the the, 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 our political leaders did conducted the New Deal, which was to get the federal government aggressively involved in practically every area of life. This was the beginning. And to sell this idea, of course, because this was a dramatically radical idea at the time, that the federal government would be involved in all areas of life, is that the proponents really had to sell this myth. That if you, if you, if you were for the rich and powerful and for the fat cats, then you didn't like federal government. But if you were for anybody else, then you had to favor um, big government. That's really where it began. Now, we've had a lot of studies afterwards that have given us this, this sort of revisionist history of the New Deal. Did it really help out the little guy, so to speak? And there are plenty of historians now, particularly the great book, The Forgotten Man, that, that, that uh, demonstrates how in many ways the, the, the uh, federal government's New Deal did not help us recover from the Great Depression. And oddly enough, when you look at the court cases from that time, from the New Deal um, area, you see these court cases in which really it's, it's not big government against really big, wealthy fat cats. It's big government against the individual. Schechter Poultry, Wickard versus Filburn. I'm not going to go over those, those cases, but they're really involving individuals and small business people who are, you know, being taken to court by the government. So even in its very uh, genesis, you got the feeling that this maybe wasn't something that was going to be looking out for the so-called little guy. And this myth then, this myth propounded by the New Dealers, has, has had amazing staying power. So they had to propound it during the 1930s because what they were doing was such a radical change in history. And they had to say that what we're doing is going to help the little guy. Um, and this, this myth has... Has, has stayed with us. It stayed with us during the 1950s um, uh, when the Democrats went out of power, and, and, the, and there was never a, a retrenchment from that. We've had periods like the Great Society in the, in the 1960s. Uh, we've just gotten over the Obama presidency in which we've seen a, a, a drastic increase in the, in the federal government. So we've seen periods in which the, the, the federal government has grown sort of rapidly even out of, its, uh, uh, out of its already large state. But even in the quiet period, so to speak, the federal government has never stopped growing. Um, and the, the, I think the power of the myth has never, you know, lost its appeal. 
Well, one way to look at the myth then and to try to unearth it is to actually look at uh, all the different government programs and actually how they work. The book, uh, my, my book lists these and talks about different things, but that's almost an unending type of, of process. And certainly the people here at Acton Institute uh, uh, address this very well and, and, uh, and dedicate themselves to it. I want to bring up just two examples, though, that really struck me, more recent examples that occurred within the last um, decade, um, that really tell us something strange about um, the role of big government. The first one is when the, the uh, Affordable Care Act was being debated and being, uh, 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 being debated by Congress and, and then passed. And the argument then used by proponents of the Affordable Care Act was that it wasn't going to increase taxes at all. Uh, because it was going to be paid for out of the waste in the Medicare and Medicaid program. Now, that's an astonishing statement when you think of it, because the Affordable Care Act was the largest domestic initiative in a, in a half century. And this was going to be paid out of simply waste out of government programs. I mean, that's really astonishing. If that is the case, then there is so much waste. There is so much waste there that ought to tell us uh, there's something quite wrong here. Uh, the other example I oftentimes think of is when the IRS scandal came out, which the IRS was um, uh, targeting conservative groups for tax audits. Um, uh, David, uh, David Axelrod, the um, advisor to President Obama, when asked about this and asked about um, kind of why the president didn't know about this or didn't do anything about this, he responds that, well, the federal government is really too vast to know about these things. <laughs> And that was his excuse, but when you think about it, it's, that's the best argument that you could give for the fact that the government has really gone way too big, and the fact that not even the president is going to be able to know what the IRS is doing in terms of targeting opposition groups. So you have examples like this, and you have examples from uh, government programs all the time, which should say that perhaps the government is not performing either as it says it's going to or as it should be. But that still has never really eroded this myth of big government. And so what I want to do today is take a broader look um, at, at, at themes really pertaining to uh, the relationship between big government and the individual. I think when you look at the historical evidence, you see certain themes coming out that perhaps instruct us about how government and how this, this, um, this myth really operates um, and, and why, in fact, it is just a myth. So we say that we have big government, right, to help the powerless, to help the people who, who, um, who have no power in the private, uh, private society or private economy. Um, but the thing is, is that big government responds to big power. Uh, big government, of course, is the result of politics. Big government is a result of big political power. So logically, how can we expect big government to respond to the powerless. Take for an example the relationship between big government, for instance, and big business, uh, and vice versa. Um, so again, under the motif, we need big go big government and big business are form a kind of adversarial uh, relationship where big government represents the powerless uh, in opposition to big business. That's not the way it operates uh, at all. Um, Big, big uh, business, in fact, likes big government. Here's, I think, the best example I can give you. Um, uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, after the Dodd-Frank bill was passed, this was the bill that regulates the financial services industry, was asked if this was going to hurt J.P. Morgan, asked by his shareholders if this were going to hurt J.P. Morgan. He says, no, it's not going to hurt. It'll impose a cost on us, but in the end, we'll be better off because it will widen our competitive moat. What did he mean by that? What he meant is, is that this bill is going to put a lot of smaller banks out of business because they can't afford the cost of regulatory compliance. They can't afford the cost of trying to uh, comply with all of the regulations that this, this act was going to uh, impose. J.P. Morgan, obviously a huge bank, has lots of attorneys, can't afford that. So what does it end up doing? 
what, what government regulation in that case did was, was it, it lessen the competition, drive out competition, and hence solidify the position of the bigger economic players. Big government likewise, likewise likes big business. It's a lot easier to regulate a field where you have one or two big players than if you have 100 or 200 small competitive entities. It's a lot easier. Um, and so therefore, uh, the, the two, big government and big business, end up melding together and, and being attracted. And what we oftentimes see, too, is that in eras of big government or when government, in, in times when big government is embarking on, on a kind of a big regulatory program, we see at the same time that there is increasing concentration or monopoly in those industries being affected. We saw it with both the Affordable Care Act recently and Dodd-Frank. In the Dodd-Frank Act, what have we seen? We've, had, we've seen less and less banks. We've seen the banking industry consolidate, fewer and fewer startups. Same thing with Affordable Care Act, more concentration, fewer competitive hospitals, fewer competition in that way. So they both worked together in a way to reinforce bigness. So once it's reached a critical size then, Government becomes an end in itself. And its first pr pr uh, priority then is to perpetuate itself. I think a great example, uh, we can see it right now, is with the Consumer Financial Protection Board. This is a result of Dodd-Frank, and we're seeing it play out right now, uh, in which President Trump has appointed a new head to that agency. This is an agency that's uh, like a regulatory agency uh, under Dodd-Frank that's going to regulate um, the um, financial services uh, area. But the outgoing head of that agency appointed a, um, uh, a successor. The retiring head appointed a successor. President Trump point, appointed a different successor. And the new successor actually went to court to stop the president from appointing a head of this agency. Now, now just from the outset, that sounds ludicrous. The president can't appoint a head of an agency that's a member of the executive branch, the president is in charge of the executive branch. That seems ludicrous. Um, and yet that's what you have. And of course, why are they opposing the, the uh, president's uh, appointment? Because the president is critical of the agency and may cut back the agency. But a good example, really, about how um, government then becomes a sort of an entity itself with its primary goal of perpetuating itself. And with respect to it being an end in itself, I think we oftentimes see government become a proxy for social problems. So here's how that works. We have a social problem. We decide that we're going to have a government program address it. We start the program, we fund the program, and then what do we do? We declare the program or we declare the problem solved. Uh, what happens then is government becomes the focus. Individuals just become the it's like justification for the problem. We never really get to the heart of it. I think you see it in the field of education. What we do in the education, we always talk about how much government is spending. We don't talk about what's actually happening in uh, the field of education. What about student proficiency? What's actually taking place? We see the same thing in, in the war on poverty. We ignore the causes of poverty. We're just looking at how much government uh, is spending. And so what we're seeing then is we're seeing the government's increasing and increasing and increasing its spending, but the poverty level is going nowhere. The strange thing about it is that the poverty level was coming down before the war on poverty in 1965 was instituted by the federal government. And then once it was instituted, the, federal, the, 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 the um, poverty level has essentially remained the same. The federal government spends almost a trillion dollars on its anti-poverty programs. If you took the money that it spent and simply divided it among all the people who fell below the poverty line, we would eliminate poverty altogether. There would be no one under the poverty line as it exists now. I'm not suggesting that that's what we do, but what I am suggesting of is, wow, the federal government must eat up a lot of that money. So in its expansion, uh, 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 big government oftentimes uh, not only uses the individual or the poor to justify itself, it can oftentimes 
uh, betray, in fact, the poor or the most powerless in society. I think a good example of that, again, I'll stick with recent examples, the 2008 uh, housing and financial crisis. You know, how, what happened there? The federal government decided that it wanted to get uh, uh, lower income people in homes. And so it changed the underwriting requirement and required more loans to be given for um, uh, 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 lower income individuals. They're the, so they, uh, uh, mortgages and loans had to be given as mandated by the federal government. Uh, people got into homes, they couldn't afford them, and that was, of course, the beginning of, of this mortgage crisis in which we had all of this, um, these mortgages that couldn't be paid back. Now, what, what happened to the poor then? So that kicked off not only a, a housing crisis, but a, a recession. And so out of that, what happened? The poor, loses, the, the poor lose the homes and they lose their jobs in the recession. They got sort of hit twice. It, it was, uh, in a way, reminiscent of another housing program that the federal government conducted back in the 1960s when it erected huge um, uh, urban high-rise housing projects. And, uh, you know, sometimes the federal government apologizes for things. It ought to apologize for that program because what it did is it housed in one building um, everywhere from the elderly and, and uh, single mothers with young children, along with, with uh, uh, drug dealers and, um, and, and gang members, uh, they were a mess. Um, uh, to sort of prove the point, they've all been torn down uh, now. And of course, I think another way in which um, the, gov the federal government can betray the poor is through the, the increase in dependency. Now, we don't often talk about dependency, I think. And to harken back, I began talking about Charles Dickens, and I think Charles Dickens would say, would ridicule dependency as if dependency is some leftover of Victorian morality. You know, uh, but we haven't so much thought about dependency, and yet we're finding that dependency is becoming so much more entrenched and that individuals are becoming dependent. And I ask, is that really a compassionate way to deal with individuals, is to make them dependent? Uh, if you contrast the poor in 2017 with the poor in 1937, I picked 1937 because that's the middle of the Great Depression, the worst economic crisis the country's ever had, um, in which 25% are out of work, even the people who are working are barely making it. There wasn't the kind of of situation there that there is now. Sometime, you know, study that and contrast that. The poor in 1937, who was so much worse off materially, and yet what happened? You know, a decade, a decade and a half later, they were entering the middle class and back thriving again because they hadn't become dependent. The, the poor in 2017 are, are becoming entrenched incapable of moving out of their uh, particular position. And so oftentimes, I think we've seen that recently, again, during big government expansions, government tends to waive work requirements in its social welfare programs, therefore expanding its net, bringing more people into it, and making more people dependent. And in a way, of course, this makes sense if you're, if you're advocating for big government, because the more people that you bring in and they bec become reliant on you, the more you have created a permanent constituency, uh, thus justifying a, a longer and, and, and bigger uh, type of government. Um, Big government not only can betray, uh, but it can also backfire in its intentions. Um, and I think this is because the most basic intention of government is to expand itself. That's the first and foremost um, uh, intention. But you look again at, at the Affordable Care Act, and you, you, you look at, at all of the intentions and promises made, the, the notion of affordable care, the, the notion of more and more choice, um, the, 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 uh, all the promises made there, those promises have not come true. That we have had decrease in, in, in the number of providers, we've had decreases in choices, decreases in freedom, uh, 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 harmful effects on the employment because employers are not wanting to have people uh, or fall within the coverage of this act. You also find it particular, I think, in the area of higher education and the, the federal student loan program. It's a great intention, right? Make student loan, make, make college affordable to everyone. We don't want it to have college be something that's, that's uh, available only to the wealthy. First of all, 
as a, as, a, as a matter of fact, the poor have not done well in this. In fact, the poorest have not increased at all their college graduation rate under this program. But think about how the program works, too. The program, in effect, who's been the biggest beneficiary of the, um, of the federal student loan program? It, it, my employer, higher institutions of higher education. It has allowed tuition to skyrocket because there's money there to pay the price. And so that's been the primary beneficiary of this program. But what do students do? Granted, you can go to college, but once you get out of college, you're left with an astronomical debt and a debt that we are now grappling with because we're, we're seeing crisis levels of defaults in this area. So I think this is another area of, yes, an intention that seems good on the face, but in the end just uh, uh, hasn't accomplished its goal of increasing the college graduation rates of the poor. In the meantime, it is just saddling uh, students with unmanageable debt. I'll end on, on this point. I won't have a lot of time to explore it here, but maybe through questioning and answer, um, uh, uh, we might do so. But I, I, another, I think, aspect of big government is the effect that it has on uh, uh, other private social institutions that, in fact, are valuable, invaluable, to the poor, working, and middle class individual. All these mediating sort of institutions of society that, that help the individuals, that help the individuals. The big, our, our area of big government is increasingly sort of making our society into the individual on one level and systems of government on this and nothing in between. Of course, traditionally, America has been a, a, a society in which we have civil society, all of those things of society, uh, neighborhoods, uh, volunteer organizations, families, uh, uh, religious organizations, all of that sort of in between that that uh, respond to and help uh, individuals. These are the kinds of, of, of institutions that can address behavioral problems. You know, the, the Brookings Institute um, uh, has said that if a person gets married before they have a child, avoids going to jail, gets a full-time job, any full-time job, anyone, even a, a, um, a, a minimum wage job, uh, and graduates from high school, they have virtually no chance of ever falling into poverty. And, and, but all of those, of course, relate to behavioral. Notice there was nothing there saying that they have to have so much money in the bank. That's behavioral, and that's the kind of, um, uh, that's the kind of um, um, uh, issues that, are, that private society and the institutions in private society can best deal with. Okay, but I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and ask questions about that. I haven't had a chance to fully sort of uh, explore that, but I want to leave plenty of time for question and answer. Right, Dylan? Yep, um, and I'll get us going uh, just with, with a, a, a quick question. Um, I enjoyed the, the lecture, and I was curious just to bring this a little more down to the tangible. What does big government look like in the lives of just everyday people? So let's say a single mother working two part-time jobs, trying to provide for her kids. You know, where is she encountering big government, and where does this problem affect her life? Well, I think big government then, um, of course, you can encounter, right? You have local government, state government, and federal government. So it's difficult to weave out and separate all of the different types of levels there. Because on the other hand, also, federal government may be funding programs at the city and state level. So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, uh, a, a kind of section off really in, in what way they are, um, uh, they are encountering it. But I think in one respect, uh, you know, there is an argument that you could be made, again, for this, uh, I'm using big government very generically, but big government does a pretty good job, I think, acting as a safety net. So we should have a safety net in society, something that catches people if, if, if they um, uh, fall in hard times, something happens to them and they, they lose their job, they lose all sources of income. You know, we, we don't want that person to sort of fall you know, through the cracks and, and we want to catch them. Government does a pretty good job of that, of catching people. Um, 
But that seems to be then at that point, again, this is where I think oftentimes that the institutions of civil society do a much better sort of job in vaulting that person out of that safety net then. Once they have been caught, yes, but then how do they get them out? Because oftentimes um, what you need is you need you, you need a response to customize. There's a reason I fell into hard times. There's a reason I'm having difficulty. Government is not set up to do that. It cannot handle behavioral um, issues. It cannot, ha it, it cannot address those kinds of things. Um, uh, other types of institutions that are non-government, in fact, can. And they can actually help vault. And they do, historically and empirically, they do the best job of it. We oftentimes see that uh, in education, OK? You guys probably. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, you have to say yes because your teachers are here, of course. But again, the, the oftentimes private institutions can do a better job at, 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 at that element. Government can, can do a good job catching uh, uh, and providing a safety net. But that safety net can't be permanent because that isn't good for the individual either to just be caught constantly in a safety net. Nobody gets up. Nobody gets up in the morning and say, I just want to live my life in the safety net of government. That's not a dignified life. Um, but I'll bring it around then to your question, Dylan. I mean, the ways in which, um, I don't know how to answer that question kind of in a way, the ways in which someone can confront government, the, the, there's so many different types of, of ways from all of the different um, social welfare programs from just simply all the regulations. A single a mother of, of two children might want to open a, you know, a, a, a business. Maybe, maybe she's a good hair braider and wants to open that out of her home. And all of a sudden, boom, she's got government regulations then that are going to govern you know, how she can, um, uh, whether she can do that business or not. And it, that field alone I haven't touched on, but that's an amazing field, this, this um, licensing field in which the government licenses people to work in, in, in areas. Now, I understand why we want a brain surgeon to undergo, a, um, to, to undergo different requirements to make sure that they're capable of doing that. But when you look at this, you oftentimes see that the, the poor, the jobs that the poor can get into are more regulated than the jobs that the wealthiest can do. Hedge fund managers don't have to have many regulations, you know, not a head, but a hair braider who's trying to do it on the side has to go through all kinds of regulatory burdens. Thank you. Uh, Ivo Soljan from Grand Valley State University. Professor Gary, uh, two questions. One is, is there a specific study, a very precise one, about the ultimate kind of vision of government, how big or how small? Uh, something that would, I know it's a very tough question. And, but uh, we're talking about that a lot, you know, the idea of big government, and especially from one side of the spectrum, we hear that the government should be actually minimized. Now, what is the ultimate vision of that? Um, the other question was, um, I um, realize that very often uh, our representatives in the Congress are not quite sure what the, the size of the government would be. Uh, some of them who were running for the office uh, even show that publicly without not knowing, you know, what particular uh, branches of government should be cut down or should I say reduced. So what's to be done about these two things? Thank you. Yeah, so the first question is, is there some kind of optimal level of government that seems to just work as well? So a lot of different people have done different types of studies. Their studies are all focus on just the connection with the size of government and the levels of economic growth. So generally, the bigger that the government gets beyond a certain point, our ec the economic growth goes down. Um, so you, if you cut the size of government, you increase uh, rates of economic growth. So that's the most of the studies I see. Um, and if you really wanted to go to some place like that, you go to like George Mason University and the, 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 the Mercatus Center there would have things. But that's most of the studies there. But just looking at the issue of economic growth. So it's not looking at the broader issue. The, some of the things I've looked at today are really the broader things about the size of government has a lot more to do with it than just simply money and economic growth. It, has, it, ha, it impacts us in a lot of different ways. So there's nothing there that kind of tells us automatically. 
what to do it. And in fact, I think in a way, government has grown to be so big that it's pretty hard to sort of say, you know, what level it should be. And it's grown so big, too, then I think you're right. I think that, that, um, that uh, members of Congress get elected and they go to Congress thinking, OK, I'm going to kind of clean this thing up. But then it's so vast that where do you begin with? And I think that's what we've seen the problem. And then, of course, once you begin talking about it, I think we need to look at it and, and, and cut it if we need to cut it, then you come, this argument comes back at you, well, you're hurting the little guy then uh, if you do that. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's a difficult situation and it's, it's not an easy question really to answer in terms of, you know, you know how we go about uh, uh, that and, and how, how we do it. There is no, in a sense, ideal size, I guess, that we can come up with, but it's just a matter of, I think, I think looking at it and, of course, you know, keeping this notion of civil society because there is a point where government then becomes so big that it begins kind of crowding out the things that really have become hallmarks of American society. Um, I think a great example of it, really an astonishing example of it, was the um, Supreme Court case lately involving the Little Sisters of the Poor. And so you have this religious organization that dedicates itself to helping the elderly poor, and they do a great job with it. I mean, they are the most efficient organization in the world in terms of providing help to elderly homeless and providing um, housing and, and sustenance for these individuals. And yet they didn't want to comply with, of course, the Affordable Care Act because of the contraceptive mandate. But the federal government wouldn't give in at all on this contraceptive mandate, which infringed on a very basic, fundamental religious belief of this organization. It, to, to me, that tells me that the federal government sort of very suspicious of these other organizations and wants to drive them out. And yet, if you live in a home run by the Little Sisters of the Poor, you're going to live a lot better life than if you li li live in a home than just simply paid for out of Medicaid funds. Hi, uh, Clint Abbott with the Potter's House. So I want to go back to the safety net uh, statement that you made. I certainly understand the idea that government cannot in any way be an ongoing uh, help or or training to, to bring people out of whatever it is that they need the safety net for. But my question is, do we really even need government to be a safety net? Um, doesn't, that, doesn't government as a safety net put in the minds of people, and then it gets carried on generation, generationally, that government is our go-to and it's the first person that we should go to, isn't it better to have a safety net to be uh, the church and the local community and, and that? So that's my question. And does government really have to be a safety net? Yeah, I guess my answer to that probably is given the realities of modern society, I'd say yes. Um, but it was certainly not that way for the first 150 years of American history. It was not that way. It was more neighborhood community based in which, uh, yes, your, your community, your, your church, your religious association, your civic associations, et cetera, would take care of you. Things have changed of, of, uh, in society. We see buildings now, you know, you see buildings now downtown. They're usually the old ones. Maybe there's the, something called the Masonic Temple. It's just a building. But it used to be a fraternal society of individuals who came together, and they did a lot. They built hospitals. They, they did a tremendous amount acting together. We don't tend to have that. What we tend now to do is have like mail order um, institutions. I belong to groups and I mail in my check and I visit them on the internet, but I don't really have a kind of a personal uh, interaction with them. They're spread out internationally. You know, it's not local where I can actually pay attention to people. So society has changed so much. Now, you can argue the chicken and the egg problem. Has society changed so much because government has taken over things and people no longer need to be involved? Maybe. That would, that would hit your um, question there. Uh, or have just, has too many things happened and society changed that, that we can't change back yet? Uh, I don't know. But certainly, um, uh, uh, I guess a starting point would be that I, I wouldn't want to advocate a taking out of the safety net because we haven't got a way, any way to make sure that there's one there. But um, uh, our, our, our arguments now oftentimes are, are you even going to have work requirements in there? You know, So we lost that battle in the last um, 10 years. But, but the idea should be that 
once you're in the safety net, then let's help you get out of it. That should be the goal. The goal isn't to keep you in the safety net. The goal should be to get you out of the safety net. I'm Rick oh. Adamy, a retired small business owner. You mentioned the behavioral issues and how they affect poverty. What are some ways to deal with these behavioral issues? Well, I think that um, um, take a look uh, at, um, uh, for instance, prisons, for instance. Uh, before the New Deal, um, um, you know, religious organizations were very uh, uh, involved in prison work, prison welfare work, or other types of um, private institutions. Now, when you're a private institution, obviously, you can focus on things like behavior. You all know that the government can't tell you what's good and what's bad or how you should act and how you can't act. The government can't tell you that and, and, and doesn't tell you um, that. And so the government may provide a material benefit. Here's a check or here's something like this. But that maybe isn't something that's going to help you change your life or help you improve your life. Um, uh, I think prison ministries is a good uh, example of that, where beginning with the New Deal and then going into the Great Society of the 1960s, those groups were largely frozen out. Now they're making their way back into it, but, um, uh, uh, but that's an example. Uh, education is an example. You know, private schools can do one thing. Public schools can do another thing. Private schools can address then um, and can enforce behavioral norms, you know, that you know that your, your um, public school counterparts don't have to live by. That makes a different type of educational experience. Um, so I think when it comes to um, uh, uh, that, that, that aspect of civil society, civil society can really deal with all of those non-material values and goals that we have, all those non-material values and goals that can create a, 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 for one thing, individual dignity, but also individual like social capital. You know, why do people, um, why do people get ahead? Why do people uh, not fall into poverty? Um, because they have a certain level of social capital that they can use to, to, to propel them up from, uh, from a, um, a setback that kind of social capital that the Brookings Institution, which is, believe me, no conservative institution there, found. But it, it, it tells you that you need that kind of social capital. Where are you going to get the social capital? You cannot get it from the government. And not even the government advocates would claim that they could give you social capital. They can't. My name is Don Foss, and I'd like you to contrast your view of government to that of Steve Bannon's. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have to say, I know of Steve Bannon, of course, and I know of what the media says of Steve Bannon. I I'm, I'm not really sure that I know enough of what he says. So I presume what, what the media says is Steve Bannon would just say, cut everything, you know, cut everything and get rid of it. Um, so that's not my view, and that's... The, I, uh, when I, I tried to clarify terms, that's what I meant, that, that I think oftentimes people who talk about a more limited or restrained government, I think they're oftentimes accused of saying, I just want to get rid of government, just get rid of government. Well, that's not the argument at all, getting rid of government. Um, because government, after all, is a social institution. Uh, and and uh, just as I value all the other social institutions, I value government. And government shouldn't be weak. We shouldn't have institutions that we want to be weak. We should have institutions we want to be strong. But we want them to be strong in the area in which they should be strong. You know, that's what we want. Like you take a religious organization. I, I want a religious organization to be strong in its mission. But, but I don't necessarily care that it's, it's strong in, you know, like um, uh, some other unrelated type of, of mission. So I guess that's maybe the, the, the point I'd make is that, that don't make that kind of or don't fall prey to that kind of accusation that you just want to get rid of, of government. Government's very valuable. We couldn't live without it. But... On the other hand, if it gets too much, just like anything, right? And this is a, a law of, of, of human nature. Anything that's too much is bad. That's all there is to it. Talk about holiday parties, you know. Hey, you, eat, you, you stay at any one, any one food tray long enough, you're going to end up going home sick. 
Uh, Don Karpinski, a retired uh, CPA and financial advisor. Uh, in the news this last week, as you mentioned, the CFPB organization, it seems like they operate in a world of their own. My question is, are there any other agencies that are possibly in the, out there in the government that operate the same where, they, where they're not accountable to anybody in the government except for themselves? Yeah, and hard the, 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 okay. the second question uh, is about accountability in the big government. How much is there of accountability how would you rate it, say, on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, you probably already know how I'm going to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. I want to rate it 1, but I'm going to rate it 2. Um, just because how. But is there much accountability? Um, so I teach administrative law. Administrative law is the law of administrative agencies. And unfortunately, you know, administrative agencies have grown to the point that there is very little accountability. Now, you mentioned the CFPB, this Consumer Financial Protection Board. This is an agency in itself. I don't know, to answer the first question, I don't know of any other agency that operates like this. This uh, agency is essentially isolated from Congress. It doesn't even get its money from Congress or its funding from Congress. It gets its funding from the uh, Federal Reserve. So it's, it's unaccountable in so many different areas. But just to appeal to you on a, on a very straightforward, the, the, the point that the, the agency, which is an executive agency, doesn't want to have the president appoint the head of that agency. That's ludicrous. Um, but there are, I mean, so to, to talk about uh, accountability of agencies, would be, that'd be a, I, I'd keep you here all too long for that. But again, I think growing to the point that they're so big that um, Congress doesn't want to take on that task. Congress doesn't want to. You can see it, Congress passes the buck. It doesn't want to dig into it because it doesn't really see where it can. So you never see in Congress is always, if, 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 a, if, if a professor asks you, what branch of government wants to give up power? Congress. Congress gives up power all the time. It's the, the federal government takes a lot of power. The courts kind of more or less hold on to what power they have. Congress has given up power all the time. And it gives up power with respect to the accountability because it doesn't even want to delve there or go there. I want to pick up on the uh, part here where you spoke about the free market. So if, pe if people were asking somebody here at Acton what they thought, they would say, well, uh, we believe in the free market, the moral uh, use of the free market, and the um, rule of law. Some people might respond by saying, well, you need a big government to be able to execute this rule of law. Um, it, it, it recalls to mind the, the gentleman who started the Arab Spring. It wasn't a religious reason. He, he wanted to start a small business in whatever country it was, and he couldn't. And so he protested, and that got people behind his, his cause. So what is the relationship between bigness and this rule of law? Right, so, so government has to, we have a rule of law. Rule of law is very fundamental to, um, to our society, to our notion of law. Rule of law has been around, and of course, societies fought for the rule of law for centuries. And we, t we look back to things like the Magna Carta, and we think about documents like those, which were triumphs in this fight for rule of law. We sometimes forget how important rule of law is. Rule of law means that we're governed not by the whims of an individual or by the dictates of power, but by law which is democratically enacted by all of us, and we live by that. That's the rule of law. Uh, some people say that big government enforces rule of law. You have to have a government to enforce the rule of law, but as we've seen so oftentimes, a government gets too big, the government becomes the first violator of that rule of law. Um, uh, uh, look at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's just one small example that it could, be, that it could in fact, become violated because it has too much power. Um, um, yeah, I mean, and I, I, it, it doesn't have to be big to enforce the law. What we're talking about, the, the enforcement realm, um, and, and oftentimes it, what enforces law, of course, are the courts. We're not really talking, when we talk about big government, we really don't talk about the judicial branch of government. We really talk about the executive branch of government, the, the, the regulatory and spending branch, not the judicial branch. Thank you for your comments, and uh, uh, certainly have sympathy for a lot of what you're saying. Um, 
Uh, I guess my question to you would be, uh, given November 30, uh, 2016 versus November 30, 2017, um, what level of cynicism do you have about the ability to help contain the growth of the Leviathan, if you will, um, today compared to back then when we had the kind of heady experience, many of us did, of having control of both houses of Congress, the executive branch, um, recognizing that uh, there's been some significant effort on the side of regulation and appointment of judges that are more originalist in their intent. Um, are you more cynical today than you were back then, or did you have more optimism than what you thought you'd see today? Well, I've just been to a holiday party, so I have to be optimistic, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, uh, I, ho I, I try not to get cynical just uh, year by year. I'm also at the age in life where now I like to think I, I'm going in five-year stages of cynicism, that uh, not every year because the years go too fast, so I can't afford to get cynical after just a year. I've got to wait five years, you know. But um, I, I think this, it, it's easy to be cynical. Of course it is. And I think oftentimes if we look at just the politics, and I haven't talked about just the politics of it, but, um, you know, if we want to be real simplistic, we say that, you know, the Democrats like big government and the Republicans like small government. That's very simplistic. But on the other hand, we also know that when Republicans are in charge of the government, we're not getting small government. You know, uh, we're not really getting, you know, we're not getting anything sort of in that. Maybe we're not getting the increases that we otherwise might get, but we're getting no dramatic change. And you can see that in the electoral scene, too. So you can see the cynicism there by what's happening happening within the, the Republican Party. There's a lot of fights there because I think a lot of people in that party are frustrated with that party's image of being like restrained government and yet not doing anything to achieve that restrained government. But I'll tell you why I'm not really, I, I, why I try not to be cynical or why I won't admit it to it in public anyway. Um, my dad always said, don't ever admit to buying gold. You know, if you, if you buy gold, there's a certain image there. Um, but uh, I do think that this is, this is a situation, of course, that this is very long term. Uh, this is a, a, a very long term um, uh, uh, issue. And it's not something that's going to be determined in a year or, or maybe five years. It's, it's going to be something that we just have to, you know, start down the road at and, and really be, you know, uh, thinking about and, 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 and thinking about really exposing government. I mean, why is it so bad to look at government to see what it's doing? How come? And we also, also ought to always ask ourselves is, how come I'm making the automatic presumption that when, when two people go to work in a government agency, they really love their fellow human being, but that when two people go to work for a small business, they really want to screw their human being? I don't know why. Yeah. We have time for one last question here in the back. Um, you had mentioned earlier that the government doesn't tell you what's right or wrong, um, but I would say that they do through laws and making things illegal. And one thing you didn't necessarily touch on is how big the government is in um, policing and enforcement of a safe society. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, how big our police force and things have grown. Yeah. So, and, and you're very right that um, when I say that the government doesn't tell you, in a way, what sometimes I, I, I use a distinction, right and wrong versus legal and illegal. And there has always been that difference. Um, here at the Acton, Acton Institute, you'll think, hear things about like natural law. Natural law tells us what's right and wrong, but the laws that we pass tell us what's legal and, and illegal. So there is a difference there. And yes, the, the, the more the government grows, the more laws we're going to get, the more we're going to have government telling us what to do. And I think you see this, too. You see this in this era of big government, a lot of laws and a lot of legalisms. But look at what we have, though, as a result of that. I mean, look at, at a, on, a, um, on a corporate basis, for instance. Um, look at all of the unethical uh, activity occurring there. Look at all the violence it's having. Look at all the social mistrust and social fragmentation. You know, there's a lot of laws, that's true, and the government, you know, is constantly giving us messages. But in terms of is it really kind of reaching that deeper level of right and wrong should come from somewhere else. So I'm a believer in natural law, um, and you'll also get that here at the Acton Institute. I'm a believer in that, that we come to ideas of right and wrong. That's not something that the government really can get on. They can pass laws. They can, they can enact a lot of legalisms. Um, but 
Yeah. Is there a lot of enforcement? Of course. Is there a lot of crime? Yes. Is there a lot of, of law enforcement? Yes. But I would kind of say, look at our society, our society that has become separated between the individual on the bottom and big government on the top with nothing in between is a society that's rife with legalisms, but also rife with criminal behavior, rife with unethical behavior um, of, of the type that I, I propose we wouldn't have if we had a little less government and more of these mediating institutions to help govern our behavior. Please join me in thanking Dr. Patrick Gary. Thank you.